Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I get the chance now to do my Clive Myrie impersonation. <laughs> I won't be as stern as he is anyway. The discussion will be in two parts, and we hope you will be able to join in at any stage um, in the usual fashion. The first part, we're going to ask the panel, and I'll introduce them in a little while, some uh, questions. And if they respond in a way that get you and your creative juices going, hang on to it for a while. Just make a note, and we'll come back to that. OK? Uh, that first bit will be about 20 minutes, and then we'll move on to a general Q&A. <laughs> All right? Good. Uh, the panel, for those of you who are not familiar, we have Vron Ware, writer and photographer. You want to tell us just a bit of the things that you've been doing? Um, how long have you got? Uh, I'm, I'm very humble to be here. I actually took pictures. Uh, I attended the Black People's Day of Action, um, both as a photographer and journalist, but also as a participant. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Professor Les Henry. This is Prof Run Way, by the way. Not just Run, this is Prof Run. And I love sharing a platform with her because she's actually central to my growth as an intellectual and academic as well. So I've heard about Vron before I met her. But uh, most of you know me. I used to be here till they handed me out of town. Hi, John. I'm not saying John handed me out. But um, yeah, I really give thanks for this because I was at this march with my twin brother. So um, loads of us. I, there are so many people on there that I recognise, and I always kind of get a little bit tearful because a lot, a lot of them are no longer with us in many ways. And I have to really greet my sister who just joined because we were central to a lot of this kind of stuff as young people. And you see, the sister always makes it to these events. So I just give thanks for that. <laughs> Third member of our panel, Patricia Pat Warmington. Yes. So um, I was Yvonne's school friend and was present at the party at 439 New Cross Road and attended, attended the um, People's Day of Action. And I'm trying to support um, some, of the, some of our friends that are still you know, going through trauma up to this time. And um, I'm, I'm really glad to be here to sort of put a different perspective on things because as as kids at the time, I was only 15, um, a lot of things were done at us and not including us. So I'm hoping that um, you will allow me to be a voice of some that um, went through what they went through at that time. I flatter myself that I don't need to be introduced. <laughs> so let's get down to it. Uh, the first issue is this. There's been many ways in which the fire and the Black People's Day of Action has been remembered in lots of different ways. And uh, Claire has listed some of these. I didn't know about that. Through reggae music. Yeah. Johnny Osborne, 13 Dead Nothing Said. Archives mm -hmm. of documents, and these are the collections of are being assembled in a variety of different places. A stained glass window? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a blue plaque, of course, um, that we know about. A stone memorial. Do we know where that is? Wooden bar. Yeah. There are exhibitions and, uh, of course, there are documentaries. And we've had community workshops. And of course, the, this film, Pioneers and Protest, Seeking Change. There's a big question about why it's seeking change, and maybe we should come to that later on. But uh, all these ways of remembering uh, the different things and the different audiences and time raises this question. Why is it important to remember the black people's day of action? Les. For me, it's crucial for us to remember it. And we also should give thanks to um, Brother Menelik Shabazz, 
who passed last year, I believe it was, because he made a film called um, <laughs> Blood of a Run. And Pat didn't say it, but I've known her from when she was, because I used to move with her brothers, especially Noel, I think it was I used to move with. But um, for me, it's crucial because what it does is it gives you, it gives you an, ex an unexpurgated look at what it was like for us growing up as black youth. And on the film, our wonderful sister said, there were parts of Lewisham we couldn't go to as black youth because people take for granted that Lewisham is a black borough, but it wasn't. And there were parts of Lewisham borough just going out into Bellingham and places like that. They were no-go areas for us. And I'm Bermondsey. talking Bermondsey. as school children before we even get to, to those places because people often have this very quaint, romanticised view of Lewisham as whatever. And I know, for instance, you know, Sister mentioned Jashaka, and I used to carry speaker boxes for Shaka, because when I started school, he, he was just leaving. But what people don't realise is we would go to clubs in, in Lewisham and we'd have to walk past the back of the cemetery around Lady World Grove. And I remember what, and I ride them, I, I've got a motorbike, I know how heavy the chains are. What used to happen is we'd get these people called greasers, they were like poor man's hell's angels. And they would ride past us on their mo motorbikes and try and hit us with the chains. So they would ride up to us, ride up the pavement. This is what we lived through. And to me, this opens up that discussion in a way that people can't say, oh, you're paranoid, or you've got a chip on your shoulder, etc., etc." To me, these are the kind of open and honest dialogue we need to have. Because most people are oblivious to what we went through as black youth, right here in this bar. Mm -hmm. Memory is important. Ron? Yes, I lived in Birmingham at that time. I've never lived in London. And um, I mean, it's extraordinary hearing you talk, Les, because now I tend to write about many aspects of, of this country and the history of racism and, and colonialism that uh, this country is involved in. And, and now young people are talking about how you can't go in the countryside if you're, if you're black, if you look different. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people have forgotten you couldn't go in neighborhoods near where that's you right. live now if you look different and i know that when i came to london in 1981 actually that summer there were parts of the east end hoxton and places where where you couldn't go if you looked like you were an anti-racist in fact let alone being black but i think going back to your question about why was this important uh why was this an important moment the black people's day of action for change i mean i worked for a magazine that was based in birmingham called searchlight which is an anti-fascist mm. anti-racist mm. uh, magazine so we were documenting through covering the, the local media. We had a news cutting service from the local media. Cases to do with um, a racist attacks, um, police violence, immigration issues. And we'd been doing that. I'd been working there since 1977. In fact, the day I decided I was going to do that was the day of the National Front March through Lewisham. As I said, I wasn't a Londoner, but I heard about this and I was already on the way to, to wanting to be a journalist who wrote about racism. So um, I think that the march, seen in historical context, was the beginning of something, but it wasn't also the beginning of something. This, these, this racist, um, the understanding of what you call the context um, was built on many years of um, racist police indifference to racist attacks and so on and so forth. Uh, we know that history. and. You know, we're still talking now about the Metropolitan Police looking to clean out the racists in their ranks yeah. and to sort of show that they're doing something. Still, 40 years later, they're still talking the same talk. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they recognise the concept of institutional racism. But what difference does that make? You know, it's a, it's a, legal, um, a legal concept now. So I think that march, that was a step. That was the beginning of something. And it felt like that on the day. Now, at Searchlight, we had um, one of the things we used to do was to have a, a like a calendar of things, events that happened that were significant in the history of, of racism and fascism in this country. And the calendar for 1981 is quite astonishing. It's just day after day, racist attacks, but also new campaigns being founded, <coughs> new campaigns getting off the ground, marches, demonstrations. You know, not a week would go by without something that we could uh, um, put in that calendar. So I think that this was, it's important to remember that history and that's why I give thanks for this film and many other, many other sort of um, community-based efforts to remember this history because mm -hmm. I, I, it's only recent actually, it's only within the last five years that publicly mm -hmm. I think 
these events have been recognized as being part of the history of this country, mm -hmm. let alone this city. Mm -hmm. Thanks in part to your work. Uh, yes, I, Pat, I was going to ask you to comment, but also I want you to talk about why oral history is important. I, I'm going to come to that, but I think mm. I really need to follow on this. Mm. And it wasn't just, I mean, you know, um, going back into 1981, um, we were all, all different cultures, black cultures, different um, um, Caribbean islands, African islands were trying to find their own feet. It was a really hard time because of, uh, you know, of um, um, of just how the political climate was. And I would say that the People's Day of Action actually brought a lot of cultures together because we're coming from a place where we didn't talk to African children. I'm being honest, as, I'm, I'm, you know, you, that, that's right. That, you, that we, we didn't talk to, um, if we were Jamaican, we didn't want to mix with Trinidadians or Grenadians it, because our, our parents were the first generation. And I know people say, oh no, we're the first generation. No, they were young when they came here. They were in their 20s when they came here from different islands with very different cultures. And, and, and th that is what they instilled in us as their children. And so we were quite divided in the different things that we ate, the, the, the music that we listened to. It was a really important time. This was the first time that we had all the the African and Caribbean cultures going on a march together, and it's very significant that the drums were being being you know the the drums are being played at the time going on. It was a real march for all of us, you know. And I remember the chant was, um, "Black people united will never be divided." That was a chant that we took all the way from New Cross. And that was the first time that we, we ever, ever did that, uh, you know, and so we, we can't forget that. And, you know, you might not see it now because everyone just mixing and merging and we're doing the TikTok dances <laughs> and we're doing all this and that. It yeah. was not like yeah. that. Yeah. It was yeah. not, you could not bring a, 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 someone from another Caribbean culture home and say that that was your partner or you was going to be seeing them. You had to do that in secret. This is what the the uh, the people step action actually did. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> did you want to talk about the role of oral history in all of this? Les? Well, if we're talking about oral history, you know, well, absolutely, because how have these tales been passed on? I mean, Vron's photos were exhibited here, was it? 2017. 2017. And it was an eye-opener for a lot of people because it's the first time they actually got a visual insight into mm -hmm. what we were telling them. I mean, you know, as I said, I, I went on the march. It was myself, my twin brother, I think one of my older brothers, my, one of my sisters was the organiser or one of the organisers of it. But for me, crucially, you know, if we're talking about an oral history project, then I still don't think this history has been excavated, which is why I give thanks to what Irie have done here. Because oftentimes we get, you know, Menelik Shabazz was in the moment, so it actually represented what happened on the day. But oftentimes what you get, you get these kinds of, um, I think watered down, glossed over, reflective pieces that don't really hit the nail. It's like when the sister spoke about them throwing chairs out of us. I think they were throwing piss and all other kinds of things out the windows when we were walking up Fleet Street. You know, and the role of the police, what people don't realise is, they didn't just try to stop us from going over Blackfriars Bridge, they were attacking the people in the front. The people in the front had to fight their way through. But the way the march was organised, because I was, I think, 23 then, or something like that, 81, my maths ain't great, I had a maths in. <laughs> but what, what had already been discussed was the bigger one then, or the older ones were at the front of the march, mm. and they came from across mm. the country, places like Birmingham, mm. Manchester, Liverpool, I think. But that was strategic, because they knew we were going to get aggro from the police, because the police were harassing us in Deptford at Ford, Fordham Park, they didn't want us to... Mm unite if people are there they were they were saying i'll oh, get off the grass stand on the pavement there were like thousands of us there so that harassment went mm. there 
But to me, you know, we do need these kind of research projects where we can speak to the people who were there. Because as um, our sister said in the film, loads of people have died from that. I know families who were destroyed by that. I know people who, who became drug addicts, I mean proper drug addicts, and died. I grew up on the road where the Francis's, I know them. We were, mm. They were one of mm. the only five black families on Demshire Road. Mm. Demshire Road links on Road Park to mm. Forest Hill. Mm. So we all knew each other. So when Jerry, peace be upon him, died in that fire, that devastated all of us. And our lives were never the same again after that. Mm. One of the issues that we're trying to focus on, though, is whether <coughs> film, oral history, music, uh, helps to create that change. And I'm going to put it back to you now in the provocative context that we have uh, just appointed our first Prime Minister of Colour. First, I don't and there, <laughs> there, <laughs> there are significant members of the government who carry the colour that we do. Where? Uh, Where is, are they? Is, 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 is this the change we've been looking for? Can I answer oh, that? Please? All right, well, jump in, jump right, in. You know, I mean, you know, um, I'm 57 now. Um, I was 15 at the time. Um, you know, the People's Day of Action happened. But let's talk about emotional intelligence. Then. <laughs> it's true. You know, it, it, the the thing is, is that will that will wish to bring back change, whatever, unless you dig, dig down into the psyche of the communities that you're serving, you will never know. And th that's where oral history comes into play, because emotional intelligence is what drives us, right? So that that's where you know where we might be having an outburst, and it's just angry black people. It's, there's a lot that has gone on before we, and, and we need to understand that and sort of, um, you know, um, look and dissect that to actually understand who we are as a people. We, we didn't have that. We, we were 15. I'm, I'm going to go back again because that's all I can do. We were 15 at the time. We were just going into our exams. And that's many of the the people that were at that party were that age group. And then all of a sudden that happened. Um, inquest happened. And then nothing happened. That's right. Absolutely nothing happened. Okay? And, and uh, this is what I'm trying to say. It's all very well about what Wish is going to do now. Mm. And, you know... Yeah. It, it, it's, 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 don't be surprised by a lot of us not going, yay, people of colour, whatever. We are still grieving and we are still feeling. We've got a long way to go. We, we want people to look at us and understand us as people. Rich has made it and good for him. Rich has made it. You know, when we, when I went to school, there were only eight um, black um, people in my year. It was a grammar school, Adjin Stano, uh, a school of 100, of which Yvonne attended, OK? So we didn't make it because a new cross fire. Something ha happened there. Please understand, something happened there that has actually um, shaped who we are today as our generation in our 50s and our 60s. And so, therefore, we really need to look at that. We really need to look at emotional intelligence and and try to tell the stories the oral history of many stories of how we came to be not our parents because we've done that we, you know we we, we we might have done it from caribbean but our stories here are is is as significant as the traditional stories that we have from the caribbean because yeah. you're talking about trauma absolutely mm -hmm. we, we we have a whole not even just um, New Cross. We have a whole country of our age group that are traumatised by what happened. We were not called um, children. When that happened, I, I remember, um, I think it was Maggie Thatcher saying that the party was mainly, you know, um, uh, full of, or, uh, you know, I'm not, like, sort of um, saying verbatim 
of West Indian children. Mm. Well, I thought I was British. Yeah. <laughs> I did. And, and so what they did was disenfranchise us from that mm. moment. And mm. that's why we have generations of young people but disenfranchised. Because who are we? Mm. Are we Jamaican? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, just for my... Are we Jamaican or are we British? And that is why we do not wave the flag so so happily because we have no flag to wave. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You see, for me, that's a, that's actually you know you, you made some crucial points because what wasn't referenced in the film was neither did the Queen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do that, and the Queen mm. usually sends out sympathy messages for tragedy. Mm. He didn't do it, mm. but her and Thatcher um, sent messages to a family who died. In Ireland, I think it was Ireland. In yeah. Ireland, I think it was in Northern Ireland. Right. And we didn't get that, but more importantly, what people don't realise is the local police around here, they were harassing us and acting like we were the ones who started it. Mm-hmm. Yet they full well knew that about three weeks before that, and I'm not saying racists burnt 439 yeah. New Cross, no, cause I don't know. Because I've spoken to people who are in there and the stories are conflicting. What I do know is racist tried to set fire to a blues dance in Sunderland Road in Forest Hill about three or four weeks before. Uh, but because people were always gathered outside house parties or blues dance, they saw them and chased them off. They had petrol bombs to bomb it out. They burned down the Albany, the old Albany. They burned down Moonshot. So the police knew they had a history of doing that. Plus, they used to attack us. That dew drop pub or whatever the hell it's called down there yeah Yeah. Mm. they used to attack us when we were coming from moonshot but they were such cowards and i will always say this they would wait until most of the people were gone then they (laughs) would attack us this white boy smashed me in my face when i was 18 with a bit of wood after we strung down shaka sound let me just bring this in because um claire's done a nice piece of research here and she's given me a quote from uh, jay bernard writer who said in a recent film, speaking of the research at the George Padmore Institute on a multimedia performance work, Surge, side eight, Jay said this, what is highlighted to me is the tricky and messy transmission of history that's marginalized, or that it's not deemed important, and how hard it actually is to transmit that to the next generation. So what are we trying to transmit to the next generation about the day of action and about these events? You're giving us a nice, messy view about it. Yeah? I'll speak afterwards. I'm all right. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Yeah, Let me hear what you've got to say. Yeah, I'll speak afterwards. That's fine. I mean, I think think that this this just demonstrates the the value and power of oral memory. Mm. It's incredibly important, not just to have it once and and then it's over, but to keep on remembering and to keep on talking about the after effects. But I was going to say something about the the other aspects of that history, the the media, for example. I think it's quite hard, (laughs) even now with our media, I think it's quite hard for younger people to understand exactly how vile it was. Mm. The day after, which we saw a little bit of the mm. um, Black Day at Black Friars, mm. that was just the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's quite astonishing. Um, and in fact, when, when <coughs> Les Back and I had the exhibition here in 2017, he got a whole panel of, of press cuttings from the George Padmore Institute, which were copied and scanned and put up. And it was, it was quite astonishing. <coughs> mm. And again, the reference in the film to the local press talked about dignity. Mm. The South London Mercury, I think it was. Yeah. But, but the rest, the mail, it is, it, it's quite, it's not astonishing, it, it shouldn't be surprising, but I think it, that is part of the history which young people now need to be acquainted with. We're opening up a whole series of issues now about how I go back to my days in this college when I was a student, a sociology student, <laughs> learning the theories of Irving Goffman and the social construction of reality, <laughs> and how we identify ourselves with the context within which we grow and the fact that we have got that to contend with when we're dealing with this messy issue of race Mm -hmm. and i well remember going in to schools and classrooms i mean at the time i was like the only black teacher and i didn't (coughs) necessarily conform to this stereotype um i was not 
the sort of person who would shout and scream and make it easy for them to think, oh, he's just like all the others. No, because I can construct myself what you mean? In, a, in a reasonable way. What do you mean? Mm. Like all the others. What do you mean? Well, their perception right. was that we couldn't articulate you our predicament. As together. teachers. No, even as, as, in, teachers. as individuals. Well, I could, right. even, my challenge was as a teacher to do that. Right. Because I was being pitching the hold constantly to go into that rebel box. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if I didn't fit into that box, then the future was not very bright, mm -hmm. was it? So we had all of those challenges. Mm -hmm. But it's the mental level as well. The teachers' perceptions were in many respects uh, no different to the rest of the community. That's right. And so it was a challenge at several different levels to get that change. Mm -hmm. They talk about it now as institutionalized racism or whatever it is. Well, that's another question because now that's being slapped down because it's wokeism. <laughs> we don't want wokeism, do we? Because that just means we have to think, and we don't like thinking, do we? So we've got that to contend with as well. So I suppose, in a way, before throwing it open to everybody else, I'm going to ask, what do you think about this institutional racism, and has it done anything to make it different? <laughs> yeah. you know, um, you know, racism comes in many forms. You know, overt, covert, been, been through it, seen it, done it. I, I, and I'm saying it so flippant like that because you just don't know who you're talking to and what, where their minds are at. And we're very good. You know, in America, you know, you, you know where you stand. If you go in the South, KKK, you know where it, where it stands for. You have BNP now who can, you know, they can have a good conversation with you and whatever, you know. It's not NF. Because National Front was a big no-no, but BNP is a bit watered down, yeah? So, you know, I I am a big fan of, um, and call it what it is, I'd like to hear your views, of social prescribing. And that is people often like to see or learn from people that look like them to help them to move forward. It just is. It just is. And especially when you're in a very disadvantaged um, um, situation, the only the only people that you may be able to actually engage with are people that look like you that can bring you forward. Saying that, yes, with with uh, you know um, institution racism, there are there are some very good teachers, but like me, that went to okay. Adinstano, there was only seven of us at five hundred. I was a teacher's pet, you know. I, I she liked me. What can I say? So, like I said, you know, uh, institutional racism is not necessarily the institution itself. It's about the individuals that are working in there and what they believe in and what they learn in terms of, of how to, um, you know, interact with individuals <coughs> from the community. So, you know, I, I know that there's this big label, but I do believe that there are those that are in in these institutions that are there to help but it's just about making them feel that they can without them feeling isolated because they've got a teacher's pet <laughs> that is a, a person from colour a person cover Ron? well it's i think this this phrase has been has been useful to get it accepted but it depends what we mean by institution and it depends on the people who work in that institution, as Pat said, I think that it's a tool. It's a tool. We have to try and use it. It's not going to end racism. It's just a tool. And having it is better than not having it, in my experience. Um, I want to hear from people who are in the audience. Yeah. Mm. It's time to throw it to the audience, then. <laughs> At the back. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, first thing, I have a suggestion first, actually. Thinking about, um, I grew up in Lewisham, born and raised, and actually can relate somehow with the echoes of Bellingham. Because even if it's not a physical threat, you still feel somehow excluded from some living quarters in that part of the world. Still, mm -hmm. um, I did a suggestion. People's Day, obviously, every year in Lewisham, we have it. Um, and I'm 33 now, but at no point at any time in my life of going to People's Day has this sort of thing been highlighted. There's a possibility, maybe, I don't know, if you've tried to connect, but I feel like that's a platform where maybe it can be shared with the general Lewisham public. I'm sure there's been ways in which it's been done, but I don't know um, if this movie, for example, could be shown or 
So I was moving forward. And the second thing was, I guess, as a teacher or educator, uh, how do you suggest uh, people like myself or Josie here go about teaching um, this history to our students? Okay. So my hands are the Arts Awards, <laughs> the Arts Awards, which is run by Trinity Trinity College. Uh, the Arts Awards are a, a, um, a, a different way of, um, um, of of young people getting accredited training that is not mainstream. So it's not quite GCSE. However, it's equivalent to. So you, it's more project based. And so you know, we talk about you know old history and the art. You know, the arts are very good with, with you know that kind of um, of construct. So the arts awards, if you look into it, um, you'll find that it's such a pleasant way of of um, young people engaging or other people engaging that are not quite ready for the mainstream. Please do look at it. I'm an arts awards assessor and I've managed to get people through uh, on that. And it goes to A-level standard as well. But it, so... And where do you find details of this arts award? Trin Trinity, Trinity College. It, um, if you go into their website, then you'll find. And, and there's funding in there to help that young person on their journey as well. Okay. The film was shown in People's Day mm -hmm. this year. I wasn't in the country. No, 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 that's all right, that's all right. Um, and I don't know if anybody you want to pick up that idea of People's Day Sorry, just to say, um, yeah, so we did Battle of Lewisham several years running at People's Day, which is, fits into a similar structure. But the film was shown this year as part of the, uh, we had an In Living Memory tent and we were showing, showcasing all the different projects. Mm. On the education side of things, each project funded by In Living Memory is going to receive a grant um, and is going to be working with the education department here at Goldsmiths to produce a pack uh, of instructional information and resources that will be freely available through the the website to so that all of the projects can get their 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 material out into schools in the borough and that those are going to be educational packs specifically created by the education department here with students and lecturers so they will be designed for the different key stages and all the resources and everything will all be there to be used so that's one of the legacy pieces of in living memory okay. education is the keystone to that so well, a lot about novels, really. I just wanted to see the visuals, like videotape footage, mm -hmm. because I'm of a similar age and I remember the time. And when you when you two were having a dis not a disagreement, but conversing about your opinion, this this had been going back way before it actually happened, and it's it would be going on from from Edinburgh and Castle all the way up to here, and it's not all. It's, you're talking about Lewisham. But it wasn't just Lewis and this, this type of you know uh, pain or coming when you go to school and being challenged. It, it's been going on for a long time. So what this this fire, which I lost my friend lost his sister in it. This 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 ripple effect started before, and this was a, a major point that happened. But it's been going on before, and it hasn't gone away. No. We we could be just been distracted by TikTok, you know, drugs, other things. And when you mentioned British Sunak, that doesn't really I don't think it does anything for today because how we parent is making the difference. Because of the pain or you know, you know, my mum's here. She spoke and I just wanted to find out what, what this was about. I didn't know what it was about. But when you talk about time and it was before and it, and it hasn't gone away and I, I just didn't see the pain. I, I know the pain mm -hmm. because we have it. But when you see, when you hear the, the, the words that the people are saying and people, when you talked about people throwing um, chains, mm -hmm. you could walk in the street and you have somebody throw a, a spanner in your back. You, you don't see that on the media and there I just wanted to see it and hear the chairs coming down, hear what the people are saying at Fleet Street. Because it because it's the media, mm. we're just getting a lot of snippets. And I, I, for me here, I wanted more because I know it's painful. Yeah. Mm. I remember, sorry, carry on. Um, no, what you're saying is important. Uh, my name is uh, Michael the Rose. And um, I first wanted to congratulate Irie on having and making this film today 
And I think we should all appreciate the, the, the new cost massacre in our mm -hmm. lives, in our faces, especially for the brother behind here who needs that visual mm -hmm. uh, impact. Um, also, I'd like to thank um, Goldsmith College for keeping the New Cross Massacre as part of the work they do here. Um, bronze uh, photographs were, were exhibited here uh, by Les Back. Mm -hmm. I came and spoke here to the Students Union a good number of years ago. Uh, just to explain, I was one of the commanders on the Black People's Day of Action. And also, I was for many years chair of the George Padmore Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which is the archive. I just wanted him to say something that, about what Les is saying, which is very important, and Bron was, was kind of backing it up. History is important, and we've got to pass that information on to the next generation. That's why I'm, yeah, so, happy. Yeah. That's why I'm so happy that you are doing the film and this event today. Going back to what Les was saying about our oral history, our oral history is important as our written history. And that's why we formed the George Padmore Institute Archive. That's why you could get some of the material about New Cross Fire there. But we all got information ourselves. And as much as we can do with our own personal archives of that event, is really important and we have the technology now going back to what Les is saying we have the technology now to do interviews and record people's oral history which can be written down and becomes a book finally I just want to say that if you are interested you can um, get Ron's book what's it called I think it's just a little one yeah. The, little, the Black People's Day of Action. Black People's Day of Action, where you see all the photographs of the Black People's Day of Action. And secondly, there's a book by my father, who, John LaRose, who mm. was the chair of the New Cross Massacre Action Committee. And that's called The New Cross Massacre and the Story. Yeah. Both are available today. So if you want more information, that's where you get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, okay. so, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. This is all, you know, well and good. I mean, I understand there's lots of material and I understand that there are archives and everything, but it's about how to feed it back mm. to our communities. So I'm a big fan of social prescribing. Um, and if um, social prescribing is about, you know, where many, many, uh, I'm talking about black um, uh, uh, people are, you know, more likely to undergo mental health issues, etc. I mean, it's a fact. Mm. And, and so social prescribing, it's all very well having those kinds of um, places where there's books and there's archives and whatever. However, we've got to find a way to make that trickle down, mm. for want of a better word, into being user-friendly so that our communities can heal. We are still broken from that time. Mm. We, we, and I'm talking about, yes, Les, I'm talking about our age group, you know, um, um, Yvonne's brother here is in the audience, and Robert's here in the audience. We're broken. There, 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 were, there wasn't any counselling that time. There was nothing. We just had to get on with it. We were 15. We were meant to go into our exams. A lot of us didn't make it. A lot of us have still not made it up to now. So I'm, very, I will keep, I'm a fan of social prescribing into using the voluntary sector, the arts, any way that we can actually get people to actually, um, different ways that we can get people to learn these things and, you know, and learn about histories so that it makes, it has an actual impact on their mental health and their livelihood and their being. <laughs> So I, I do understand about the archives and the books and that, but we need to make it trickle down I know. so that we can we can heal. We need to heal. I'm, I, I, I'm not I'm not healed yet. We need to heal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's I listen. I listen. I listen. I listen. Yes, I know. It's okay. I meant it. I'm a project. I'm a private vehicle spire. Um, Angel. Um, yeah. It's my cousin, first cousin. Born in the spire. It's also a spire from the spire. 
That was my sister's party. Mm. Okay. I was also on the black the march, the march as well. Um, I think my sisters were at the front of the march. So when you see pictures of that march, you see my sisters all wearing the banners and me some in the background trying to be like a police officer or something. <laughs> because the rage was there. The anger, the anger was there. And uh, when I go back to Pat's explanation about mental health and how you deal with that, I just wanted to kill a policeman that day. Mm -hmm. I'm to you, I won't go in there to express my thoughts. You go, if they attack me, I was going to give it all I've got. Mm -hmm. You know, seriously, yeah. that was all what I was speaking yeah. about because I had rage in me for years. Mm -hmm. So, um, mental health is one of the biggest things you don't think of because we were not cancelled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were treated like something out of a pig farm. Yeah, you know, we were just fed corn, whatever. Mm -hmm. It was disgusting, and the media didn't make it nice neither. So, the media just made it worse. So, we were made lesser, lesser than animals. Yeah, and um, it's a horrible existence, you know, because if you think about it, yeah, I lost my sister, I lost my house. Seven of them friends are my school friends, all from Forest Hill. Mm -hmm. They all went to school together, Forest Hill Boys School. Yeah. So we've got seven, seven girls that my sisters went to, apart from one that went to your school, Andy and Stano. Mm -hmm. So it affected our community really, really badly. But how do we bring it forward? How do we change things? I mean, my personal view is very much like mum's view. It's really educating our children, mm -hmm. really focus mm -hmm. on them, because nobody's going to help us but ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it's, I know it's hard, but it's, it's an investment and the story, what you've been through, they do understand it. They understand your struggle and they appreciate your struggle and they make some kind of work a little bit harder to achieve what their what their goals are. So yeah, it's all about mental health, it's all about, but it's the next generation, it's not this generation. The doors are closed, sorry for us. No, that's all right. I, I and we take see the hand and take it away. Gentlemen at the back. I would do it, she was before me. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think you talked about. You speak a up a bit. Please. I will try. You talked about a resource for schools in Lewisham, and I think if it's going, if we're talking about legacies and holding these legacies, then I think perhaps it may be uh, something that should be rolled out to schools across the country mm -hmm. and not just <clears throat> confine it to Lewisham, because otherwise it stays like a little novelty kind of thing mm -hmm. and I think you need the reality of it to be across all, all schools both primary and secondary I think that's the way to kind of hold it and keep it keep it in mind so it doesn't just fade into you know a one-off incident because the echoes of that are still being felt mm -hmm. throughout so I think to just bring it into schools the uh, they'll be freely available on the website, so we'll be able to promote them all, all around the country. Mm -hmm. I think with primary schools, because they have to access history through local history, mm -hmm. um, it makes it so much more resident for local schools in the area because mm -hmm. they wouldn't be able to teach that subject necessarily in depth in any other way. Whereas if we can make it, they can they can use a local history study. So within a, a sort of catchment area of London, mm -hmm. everyone will be able to use it as at primary level. Mm -hmm. But I entirely agree. It's got you know. The idea is we build from here. Cheers. So I, I just want to say this is the second time I've seen the film. Uh, two things really. Uh, well done, Beverly and Irie, because um, bringing this together um, it's had a much deeper impact on me in, uh, in terms of hearing um, what impact it had on you. And it reminds me of this, uh, the fact about that the debate and the discussions are important. But I think there's also something in terms of really positive that's coming out of it, which I think um, Julia and Damien are doing around the around the, um, the thing around black health inequality and the fact that Lucian are now beginning to um, develop a, a trauma-based approach to dealing with uh, the black health inequality. Which I think it's your, part of your point, that thing about... Um, Social prescribing, people, yeah. Uh, but, but, the, but also the fact that people have been through really adverse emotional experiences, lots of lots of in lots of different areas, and that we need to develop this, and it can be developed both as a, from a health perspective, but also on a neighbourhood basis as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of good stuff that can come out of it. Plenty in yeah. that. Uh, Norman? It seems to me we're having two separate conversations. Only two? Yes, two. <laughs> you see, it's like one side, because I'm trying to figure out, one side is saying, how do we get this out? Yeah. And the other side is saying the people who were traumatised, yeah, what assistance those people can have. So we have a that should be another conversation. Mm. The other conversation is how do we get the situation that occurred 
and probably happening, still happening now, mm. how do we get that out there? Right. To me, it's two separate conversations. Right. One of them, uh, conversation is, how do you get it? We need to be teaching our children in our house in the first place. Okay. We need to be ch teaching our society. And for instance, Black History Month is still going on. Get rid of it. It's one month, it's not good enough. It should be every day of the week. And who, who thought about having it in November when it's flipping cold? Oh, okay. <laughs> Look in the building. Uh, okay. Probably that's the only time that was available to give to us. But we need to take that back into control and decide when we want it and how we're going to do it. Yeah. And it should be done right through the year and we and as parents or grandparents we say but you need to be teaching this yourself and also they say you should teach it in school well that's true but if you don't know it you can't teach it <laughs> so there you go you know I guess can... right look i'm going back to my learning days as an educator learning is not a linear process you don't go from one to the other. It comes at you in a variety of ways. And in order to concretize that learning, you need a whole range of experiences. And those need to come together at some stage with your mental map about the world and what it means to you. And that is a long, long-term process. So this is a learning experience for us as well as us being able to use the experiences we've had to help move it on. Okay, we're not going to answer every question every time. Yeah. Don't work that way. That's my little contribution. Yes. Hi, I just wanted to speak to Pat about this really because I started at Adian Stanhope School in 1982 <laughs> and I've seen wow. you, some of the people involved. Who's your teacher? Oh, well, yeah, Mr. Lawrence. And Mr. Lawrence, okay. Half, okay. Half, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I tick. Yeah, go the on. point I wanted to make was, and you might be able to put my memory right, because it was a long time ago, so I might have got this wrong. We never talked about it at Adin Stanhope. Uh, uh, never no, no, we didn't. Event, no. Taught it. No. It no. Uh, what, what happened is that um, I think that it was very hard for the school to deal with. Mm. I didn't go to school after the fire. I, mm. I didn't. No, I wasn't reported for tru um, being truant, whatever. Mr. Jenkins, bless his soul, was a headmaster at the time, and he just let us do what we were doing. But we didn't even know, we sorry, we didn't even know what we were doing because we were just kids. But we were just um, left to just get on with it. Mm. And um, they didn't understand the black community, nope. but they knew that we that we were going there so they just allowed mm, us to do mm, that mm. um and um i i i understand now um um for uprising um, mm. um which i made a, a small contribution to i went back to school to school i ran to school to get the photo of all of us there in our year and that's when i understand now that they do have it on a year-to-year -year basis they have some kind of celebration but again um, not celebration or a recognition of what happened, but again, we never knew about it. Mm -hmm. We we are still left as as fifteen year olds. You you need to understand this. Yep. Even though I'm fifty seven. I am still fifteen. Mm -hmm. Robert is still there. You know, as as a, you know, a child. We're still left there because the unlocking has not never occurred, mm -hmm. and we're just fending for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for asking that question. I've got that gentleman over here. Me? Yes. Oh, thank you. I was wondering, how do we put this experience to work? Mm. Because we're not really putting history to work. <coughs> it doesn't make sense we keep going on year after year about black history okay. if we are not putting black history to work. So how do we work this experience? Now, <coughs> racism is part of the structure mm -hmm. of this community. Mm -hmm. It goes deep. Mm -hmm. And it's no good. Ants keep asking ant eater to stop eating ants. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <coughs> ants need to be in control of their own protective 
mechanism. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at ourselves, and we need to look at some of the <coughs> mind control mechanism mm -hmm. that has been embedded in us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get rid of them. Uh, we need to look at mm -hmm. what was embedded by some of the great philosophers mm -hmm. and uh, psychologists mm -hmm. who were part of the development of this yeah. institution and see what they said. Mm -hmm. We need to look at what is in that great book. And we need to really clear out all of those garbage out of our psyche mm -hmm. and get some new understanding of who we really are and where we are coming from. Absolutely. Larry, you'll have to guide me because I think we've overrun our time lots and yeah. lots and lots. So <laughs> <laughs> tell me what to do. <laughs> Think we, need to. we need to try and pull it together. I was going to ask Lewisham to tell us about their health experience. Um, does anybody want to talk about that? So, what do you ask? The me? health project. Oh, so I can tell you a little bit about it. It's um, a review that was carried out in collaboration with um, Birmingham City Council. Sorry, I started Hershey, speaking. Hershey. I didn't even say who I am or what I yeah, do. Yeah, yes, I'm very sorry. Um, my name is Juliet Campbell, and I am a one of the councillors here in Lewisham and I'm also the cabinet member for Communities, Refugee and Public Health. So it's a public health review that's been carried out um, in collaboration Birmingham City Council and Lewisham Council and looking at health inequalities. It's called Blashier, you'll hear it called Blashier and it's Birmingham Lewisham mm -hmm. African and Caribbean Health Inequalities Review. That's what it stands for. And so what the work that um, Tim spoke about earlier is that exact piece of work that we're doing. The reviews happened, it has um, 39 recommendations that have been categorised into eight themes. Um, most of you will know that there have been other reports around health inequalities, but the key thing about this report is that it's the voice of Lewisham residents. The data is around Lewisham residents. And so therefore we're looking at how we can address this in Lewisham. A key part of the recommendations was the first recommendation which asks for a recognition that institutional and structural racism have a huge impact on health inequalities. It's not about biology, it's not about people less or anything like that, but <coughs> institutions, the way that people are treated, the trauma that um, you've spoken about, all have an impact on our health. So that work is being carried out now. Um, if people are interested in being involved, they can contact me and I will let you know you can be involved in some way because there are working groups, but it's an ongoing piece of work. It's not going to stop. It's not a review that's on the shelf. Once the two years funding has run out, the hope is that we continue doing that work because it's a continuation. And I hear that from the panel. You know, all of the points that have been made are crucial and they're really important. So the trauma, the trauma that people haven't been able to heal, been able to heal from, it has an impact. If we look at things like epigenetics, we know that even the person who was traumatized, it doesn't stop with them. We talk about the institution, like institutional racism. It's almost as if it's been legitimized. We just accept an institution is racist and it behaves in that way, therefore develops policies that continue to feed into that behavior. Um, and then we talk about some of the things that Les was talking about. I just think you're absolutely right. There are lots of different conversations to be had. They all connect, but they are different conversations. There are different ways to address them. Okay, dokie. Is there anybody got a burning point that we haven't yet heard that they wish to? Oh, I can see the point. hand at the back that's really coming there and the hand there. Last, oh, there's a three. So those are the last three. Okay, lady at the back. Thank you very much. I'm from the Birmingham area, and I just want to understand what the outcome is planned for the collaboration between Lewisham and Birmingham. The now, reason. What's the purpose of it, and you know, what is the outcome? So the reason why the two areas, I mean, Birmingham's a whole city, so massive population compared to Lewisham. 
that the reason why they collaborated was something completely different. It was a conversation that the two public health directors were having on um, childhood obesity. And what they realised is that the health outcomes in both of Lewisham and Birmingham were quite similar. And also the population is very similar. I haven't got the exact data, Damien might be able to tell me, but Birmingham, I think Birmingham has the highest population of African and Caribbean people, then Ch um, Croydon, and then Lewisham. So that's why they can be a, a looking at not only collaborating, but um, comparing the outcomes in those, those two areas. The outcome of the review is literally around addressing those health inequalities that we are continually spoken that are continually spoken about. So childhood obesity, we've all had the statistics about maternity care, um, all of those things that are similar in those two in these two areas. Lewisham's one of them, <laughs> so it's here. Um, it's looking at how we address those, but looking at it slightly differently and having that recognition that the institutional lies and structural racism has a part to play. Mm -hmm. It's nothing, it's not about the people. Mm -hmm. It's about recognising the structures that create those inequalities. Yes, you, sis. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be really quick as well. Um, firstly, to say that I think um, when it comes to teaching, when it comes to teaching history um, in schools, I work as an educator and I also work at one of the schools that are mentioned by the people in the film. Um, there's so much that I said, put it in the school, give it to the school, give it to the school. But the curriculum in schools is already very dense. Um, and what I found is when teaching, in some schools there is a push towards teaching a more balanced view on African history, to teach the truth more than the little sketchy things we were taught in my generation. But what I'm also seeing is the impact on black children. And sometimes when we're teaching um, African history and the brutality of it to African children, children of African descent, they are traumatised. Yes. Mm. They are not coping with it very well. They can't mm. talk about it. I see children with their heads down, their faces really low, etc. If I'm reading the, what it's doing to them, and very often the school timetable is such that they don't get time to discuss it. They have a little quick, this is the topic, write about it here, move on. So I think you really need to be careful when it comes to teaching mm. African history, especially the ones where it's about things to do with trauma and not given the trauma that we had to the younger generations. Mm. There's a big challenge there. Mm. I see. And there's quite a lot of us that are alive today, and there's quite yes. a very, very vast amount of us yes. for that march. Reach mm. out, talk to them. Yes. They're all over this country. That's what I'm saying. And they will spread it just like a cobweb. I'm done. Good. Thank okay, you. well, that's a, that's a challenge. <laughs> thank you. I've got to thank the panel for coming along. Thank you. And for making contributions. We're here for the panel. Because I actually think that we are doing the black community in, in not just in Lewisham but other places a disservice. Mm -hmm. I started learning black history at Moonshot Youth Club in 1972. Mm -hmm. Okay. And people need to understand this. 1972. I used to go to the Stop Sus campaigns that were created by Mavis Best, where we used to meet in Lewisham, 1977. There is a history of resistance, not just here, but across the country. Mm. And I think it's being eluded. I met John LaRose when I was about 11 or 12 at Moonshot Youth Club. He used to bring resources to us. Mm. Them are people <coughs> like Prof Gus John, mm. Ras Cosmo, um, who is Elder Herakuti on Galaxy. Yeah. So I don't want people to think that you know, what mm -hmm. happened in the New Cross fire popped yeah. out of a vacuum mm -hmm. and nobody mm -hmm. never knew what to do and how to organise. I think that's doing us a collective mm -hmm. disservice. And when people talk about how do you pass those histories on, that is exactly what we were doing. That is why I'm here mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. I was expelled from school at 15, expelled from college at 16. Mm -hmm. I never learned anything about being an African in school. However, I don't expect to. And the reason why I want us to really think about this, and John's here as a historian, mm -hmm. we, we, I think sometimes we have the wrong conversations about what we need to learn and where we need to learn as peoples of African ancestry. If you're white working class, you don't get your history in school. You get the Dickensian hands. You don't get anything about what you've contributed. 
Now, if that's the context for white working class people, why the hell should we expect to be served by the people who, in my humble opinion, did not expect us to be alive today mm -hmm. to have these conversations? Mm -hmm. I think we need to have the right conversations, mm -hmm. but let's not do ourselves a disservice because we had people like John LaRose, New Beacon Books, George Padmore Centre Institute. Somebody mentioned about Black History Month. The reason why Black History Month took off in 1987 is because Ken Livingston, Linda Bellos, and I can't remember the brother's name, Sebi or something like that, Ghanaian brother, they spearheaded that. I used to go and see African-American radicals speaking at the GLA from 1982. I was there. There's been a history <laughs> All of right, that. Okay. Well, but my so, crucial point is, yeah. Africa, let's, yes. not, let's not forget no. what we have been oh, doing yeah. to address yeah. systemic and institutionalized racism. Let's not act like we've just here as passive recipients mm. of no, this stuff, because no, I, I resent that. I don't think anybody... <laughs> A fairly open discussion and it's not the end. I've certainly been saying all night it's not the end.